Hey everyone, Mr. Happy here, and in this video, I'm going to be giving you my thoughts on the events that take place in Final Fantasy XIV's recent music video, Revolutions, the main theme for the upcoming expansion, Stormblood. I wasn't originally planning on doing this video. I feel like the events that we see there are pretty straightforward, while there is some speculation to be had, but I've had an overwhelming amount of requests, both on my Twitch chat and on my Twitter, even in some private messages, asking if I was going to do a video breaking down what we see here. Now, I will say this, if you haven't completed 3.55 story, and even if you don't want to think about what could be happening in 4.0, I will say right now that we could consider this spoilers. So, you've been warned now. I don't want to see that complaining in the comment section. Uh, we also won't actually be hearing revolutions in this video. While the theme is great, and I recommend that you listen to it uh, maybe before or even after watching this video, uh, it's uh, the piece is not supposed to be used for any sort of, you know, recreational or, or used in other content similar to answers and dragon song so we're going to avoid doing that altogether without further ado we've already delayed long enough let's get into the music video here i'll pause it when necessary uh overall i thought that revolutions both the song and the music video itself here were actually a bit more impactful on me i find that the the more war theme is is more just up my alley if if i could say so myself so, um, the first couple of scenes depict the Girabanya side of things. Now, I actually want to go back to that scene right there, because it actually plays an important role in something that we saw in the benchmark trailer as well, and that was with the Alamegan Resistance fighting alongside the Ananta, one of the two new Beast Tribe quests. Up to this point, we've had mixed relations with a lot of the Beastmen. Normally, our initial, uh, our initial sort of interactions with them are usually very hostile. That's not to say that won't be the case here, but very early on we're seeing that the Ananta are probably under equal oppression when it comes to the Garleans. So we've actually found a beast tribe that, while there's definitely going to be ones we don't agree with, I don't think anyone would be surprised by that, uh, we will work more closely with them outside of those, you know, beast tribe quests that will definitely be coming later in like 4.123, etc, etc. Another thing that's already an immediate theme here is the amount of unity between the different uh, the different parts. You can already see an Ishgardian soldier. You can see soldiers from all the grand companies. And it's very frequent that there's almost this major sense of camaraderie that didn't really exist amongst the petty problems that we've had between the different grand companies leading up to this event. Now, I'm no Ethis, so expect me to miss a lot of the little things. Um, there's, you know, flying around the Griffin Mount. These are the scenes from... Uh, from patch 3.55, just sort of setting up Lisa's, uh, you know, Lisa's story, sort of just giving us her motivations, Papalimo's sacrifice. I'm still willing to bet we'll see Papalimo inside Omega's raid, since uh, I'm willing to bet he was absorbed into Shinryu after his sacrifice, similar to what happened to Louis Swa way back when. Now, one of the first things that people pointed out, and one of the first things I noticed is immediately here. Uh, you can actually see that Alice still has her, her book, that her, one of her two twin books that her and her brother shared and that they used in the coils. We also have Yishtola and Kryle with us, sort of implying that they are going to be playing a somewhat more important role, which is, again, to be expected with some of the things that are going to be happening here. But the big thing is Lisa's outfit is not the outfit from the Stormblood trailer. It's almost... Not really Tifa-esque, but almost kind of like, you know, she's got the, she's got the, you know, low cut shirt and she's got like a jacket over it. Um, it's, it's similar, but it's different at the same time. So I'm wondering if she's going to eventually end up in her Stormblood outfit. Maybe once she's earned the respect and the trust of the actual Girabanians or the Alamegan resistance and is more of a leader figure to them. Whereas right now she's trying to reestablish herself as someone who wants to fight for Alamigo's freedom. So right here we're seeing Rolger's Reach, and our initial interactions here you know, almost seem, not hostile, but they seem a uh, very, very high tension. We're immediately surrounded and then approached by the leaders of the Resistance here, including one that we've already been introduced to. You can see she was the same one with the Warhorn on the left. Her name escapes me, but she was in the recent uh, patch 3.55 or 3.5 part 2. Uh, where her outfit was all messed up when we were going over a lot of the screenshots. So she played an important role then. It looks like she's recovered from the injury she sustained, trying to get us the information about what was happening with Illbird in 3.5 Part 2. Uh, so our initial interactions here don't exactly look to be on completely friendly terms, but it looks like we are brought in front of them and Lisa explains her role and everything. Probably going to be hearing her explain her relationship to Ida very, very frequently. We also get to see an uh, occupied Alamigo with the Garlean flags hanging all over the place. 
And of course, we start to get more glimpses of our big baddie. It's not the Assians this time. It's not the Allegans, although I'm sure they'll play some sort of role. We have Big Daddy Xenos Ye Galvis, the son of the current emperor. And he is a monster when it comes to his height. I don't know if they're pumping Allegan drugs like the ones that are used on, on, the, uh, on the bosses of the Crystal Tower. But these guys are huge. And I guess like father, like son when it comes to Xenos, you know what I mean? Again, seeing a lot of unity, you can see all the different, uh, all the different nations sort of gathered together there, uh, sort of preparing together. Now, a big question we have here is the mountain over in the side there. A lot of people think we'll be entering the interdimensional rift around that area because it's presumed that Omega crashed somewhere around where that uh, that giant gaping hole is on the side of a mountain. And it makes sense. It falls in line with the scene that we see with Omega versus Shinryu and uh, what actually will come to transpire, you know? Uh, I have a feeling that that is going to be the central location for the interdimensional rift, or at least for the first entrance to the interdimensional rift, uh, which is the eight-man raid that's going to be in the expansion. Uh, as for this, this boat ride, I have to assume something's going to go wrong on this boat ride. This appears to be the boat ride over to Kugane, uh, where we're actually taking off from. I'm not 100% certain. You can see uh, quite a few different people here. And then we have our first look at Yatsuyu, who I'm going to have to assume is going to be a pretty major force that we have to deal with. Keep in mind that she is allied with the with the Garlean. She's the current Viceroy of, of the uh, Doman region. Uh, I keep, the name's escaping me right now. But we'll see, we'll see more of her later, so we'll talk about her a little bit later, some scenes. Now, this was interesting right here. So you're seeing that these are sort of like basic workers being bullied around by the Kojin, but you can also see there are Garleans hanging out in the back, and there are some flags hanging in the top left, although with the woman kind of blocking them, it's hard for me to make them out entirely. Uh, the big thing here is I'm wondering if there are more Kojin that are allied with the Garleans, either out of fear or out of uh or just out of being oppressed by them you know and they are just they're almost like they're muscle men that actually are native to those lands it would give the garleans a lot of power having some sort of turtle race that's able to you know traverse the seas as as easily as the kojin are which is a stark difference compared to what we saw in the benchmark trailer uh gosetsu there looking like he's ready to fight after whatever is going on with that kojin right there and finally we have us entering kugane which is a neutral land that is not it's not under garlean occupation but i mean this is supposed to be neutral land a port city where anybody would be welcome and violence is not welcome now the first thing we'll notice here is a we have tataru with us so hopefully she can make some snazzy new getups but two alice say is now wielding a red mage weapon uh, we'll see later on, but there was always, you know, thoughts that she was going to be a Red Mage, even though her weapon in patch 3.4 was completely different from what the Red Mage weapons are now. It seems that Alice has made the full exchange and is actually a Red Mage. We're not, we don't see the transformation necessarily, but we've seen now two different scenes where she's had her old, you know, Arcanist book and now where she's actually using the Red Mage weapon. This scene right here appears to be an air bubble under the water. We've seen plenty of inklings of this throughout screenshots as well as uh, as well as well through the actual Stormblood trailer. So it's just a beautiful area. You can see it has an etherite for teleporting. And you can also see that the Kojin are uh, not exactly uh, liking us being here. So, you know, Alice say, almost looked like she left one alive, probably their leader, to make a purpose. But she was uh, not messing around. She just wants them to understand what they're up against. Now, this scene right here is very important. So we have Fordola. She is a character who is personally the one I'm looking out for the most. She was born when, Garli when, uh, when the Garleans had already occupied Alamigo. And so she's not really accepted by the Alamigans because she fights almost as a mercenary force for the Garleans. But she's not really accepted by the Garleans because she's not a pure-born Garlean. So she fits in sort of that weird space where she's really on nobody's side. She just takes orders from who her bosses are. And that's why she's a character I'm looking out for the most. As for where the scene is taking place, I'd have to imagine we've switched back to Girabani at this point, and this is actually an attack on Ralgar's Reach. So I, it's hard to say precisely, but it's definitely not over in the Kugane region. You can tell from the various uh, structures around you that it's not very far eastern. On top of who's fighting, I mean, these are the leaders of the resistance, the Alamegan resistance who are going up against Fordola, and as we'll see here in a second, Xenosia Galvis. So I'd have to assume this is a major scene that takes place in Ralgar's Reach itself. We also see Raubon here, and we know Raubon, while he's not probably, he's probably not opposed 
to helping on the Kugane front will probably be a more prominent figure over on the Girabanyan front. We also get a first look at Ida versus Fordola, but not before she tries to attack Xenos, and he is not having any of that. Now this scene right here, sorry about that, you can get some recommended videos like that. This scene right here has been very telling. A lot of people are concerned for Yastola because we were given basically the foreshadowing of her death early on in the 3.x main story. Apparently, after traveling through the ether in the land, she was, her sight's gone. She can't actually see because of her exposure to that degree of ether. So she's using her own, basically, life force to see and feel her surroundings in order to get around. And according to Matoya, it's putting a strain on her body and on her life. So when people see a scene like this, they have to assume that maybe that power is going to come to an end at a very un at very bad time, pretty much. I refuse to accept that Yishtola will die. I'm more akin to believe that Matoya would give her life to save Yishtolas, uh, you know, the life of the old and the wise for those of the young and, and, uh, and growing, for instead of Yishtola dying. Yishtola's way too important of a figure in Final Fantasy XIV over in Japan. She's basically XIV's poster child over there. So while she's made to be badass in certain senses, uh, you know, and as you can see right here, basically completely towered over by Xenos here. Um, I, ha I can't imagine them killing her off, even with even more foreshadowing leading to her demise in scenes like that. Now keep in mind, we're, we're more than halfway through, and a lot of the next parts are a lot more observative and uh, exciting than they are so much foretell uh, foreshadowing certain events. So here we have the uh, master of Yugiri and Gosetsu. I might actually need to pull up the website because I'm having... I, it's because everyone just calls him Mitsurugi. <laughs> and so I actually, I've heard people call him Mitsurugi so frequently. It has actually made me forget his real name, which is almost sad in a sense, if you ask me. Um, we have the different characters here, though, and I'm pulling them up as we speak. Here we go. Key characters, uh, Hien. I should have known, we just talked about this on State of the Realm, or Hien. Uh, he is actually the heir to the throne of Doma, and like I said, the master of Gosetsu and Yugiri. And he is going to be what appears to be the leader over on the Eastern Fronts. Uh, so just quickly, them bowing to their master, of course. Uh, you know, not too much of a surprise there. Again, the Azim Steps looking beautiful, but what I love about this scene with the Azim Steps is we actually look like we'll be very deeply interacting with the different uh, tribes of the Aura. There are many, many tribes. I believe a total of 50 tribes, if I, if I remember correctly. And it looks like we'll be interacting with the leaders. Apparently that guy defeated Titan because he had a Titan axe just chilling right next to him. And uh, the, all the different robes and the different beliefs seem to be playing an important role here. Now, one thing that's interesting to me about this scene in particular is that that vase is immediate, and then walking up to the spot is immediately followed by what looks to be almost like Titan, like a larger version of Titan Eggy's summon animation. I'm curious to see if that vase is one of the Kojin's relics, which is said to actually carry the. Uh, the ether or the spirit of some of the gods of the Far East. And if the reason why we don't actually see a figure appear here is because that figure is actually going to be appearing in some way. Moving forward, uh, it took me a while to read this. That says liberty or death, just so we're 100% clear. And he's basically declaring that they are, you know, they're going to fight. You know, they're either going to liberate themselves or they'll die. We also have uh, this character here. I don't believe this character is anywhere on the artwork that we see. So it's probably a young Zela, uh, uh, I shouldn't say young Zela, a young Aura from one of the tribes that is actually roaming the area right there. Um, and then we have Lys, of course, sleeping. And I almost called him Mitsurugi again. Hien, looking like he's preparing for battle. Uh, we're getting to see more of the occupation sort of making its presence uh, apparent there. Yatsuyu, of course, they tried to give us as little of her as possible. And then this looks like a focused assault on one of their gates. Uh, from the Stormblood trailer, that eventually led into an arena where we fought Suzano and, uh, and Yojimbo, as well as uh, Diogoro. So I, don't, I doubt that's going to be the same use for it. It almost seems like it's, it's more of a concentrated effort, either on the Kojin base for Suzano, or it's, Yatsu, or it's Yatsuyu's base. The main thing to remember about that place right there is that it is guarded by Garlean tech. So we have to assume that it's one of the fronts for Doma over in the Far East. Because the rest of the scenes are pretty much us waging war with them on both ends. Oh yeah, and Yatsuyu, of course, stepping on. It was unavoidable. You know, this this meme is going to be there. We can't get just... 
she's she's a bad person all right just try to keep it in your pants it's a video game that's all i'll say um we also have another scene right here where we can see lise once again going up against fordola uh, some people are beginning to suggest that fordola is not who we think she is I, let, let me put this a lot of people are beginning to think that because we see lisa and fordola against each other so frequently that they are some way blood related some people think it's ida i would like to point out fordola is quite young so that is unlikely very very unlikely that fordola could ever be ida now that being said and i'll read fordola's description a young soldier born and raised during the imperial occupation of alamigo there you go so she's not ida just to clear that air. But I, I wouldn't be surprised. They kind of almost... She's someone without a purpose. And Lise is trying to find her purpose. So there's almost some sort of, you know, clash there of, of uh, identities. As well as getting to see more of Lise fighting. Which is good to see. And once again, we have him pulling out one of his... Looks like this one has a ether or electricity around it. And Yugiri is going up against him this time. And doesn't look to stand a chance at all. Now that's a very, very difficult scene to properly pull... Uh, really any information from. It's hard to tell if this has something to do with this scene right here. If it's Allegan tech, if it's Garlean tech, if it's, if it's primal energy. It's very difficult to tell what this sort of mysterious being is. Again, is it some sort of god from the Far East? Um, is it, you know, Susano in some way? If I recall correctly, and again, I have all of the um, I have all of the descriptions of the different beastmen and whatnot here. Susano is the Lord of Revel. I'm not saying that doesn't mean it can't be involved in a lightning cloud. But considering the Kojin are turtles, that would be a, a little bit strange. And it almost seems to be attacking the party and uh, a regular problem that they're facing off against here. The energy there looks like the same energy given off by Magitek, however. So I have to assume it's a new Magitek super weapon that we'll have to deal with. Um, not necessarily like an Ultima weapon, but just something that they've developed over this time. Even with Nero not really playing a role. I'd also like to point out Nero is completely absent from all of this, leading us to believe he's really going to be more on the forefront of the interdimensional rift, which was kind of expected of him anyway. Uh, this scene right here, it looks like, uh, if, if I had to wager a guess right here, it looks like uh, Gosetsu had almost accepted his fate in that scene right there, where he puts his sword down after killing somebody, and then he just kind of... I, it's almost it's it's it looked like he was accepting his situation in a sense this looks like a bunch of the rebels are actually with barely any weapons necessarily are going to attack a uh, a garlean stronghold maybe some maybe it's the uh, stronghold that holds up the energy for one of those protective shieldings that we mentioned out in kugane um, we can see some of the npcs that look similar to the scene with the kojin earlier where they were thrown down and the, some of them just look like you know common farmers that are out here you know they just grabbed whatever they owned and just went in. You can see, uh, you know, pitchforks. You can see what look to be like, you know, hammers that are almost haphazardly made. So uh, that plays an important role here. Once again, we have Hien uh, almost looking over onto what looks to be something that'll be a uh, like a final battle. And here, now this is them actually attacking that fortress. We get a better angle at it now. And you can see, again, there are a lot of Garleans involved in this. Yes, it's surrounded by water, but if you look out onto the right, the structure keeps going up and up there. But it is a destroyed area. If there's some sort of relic there, it's hard to tell. But this is Girabanya right here. I don't know if this is supposed to be a play on Midgar, because it does have some similar vibes to Midgar, you know, the rising tower out in the middle, this big cannon that is no doubt going to be somewhat akin to that of what we had to deal with with the weapons. Does it mean another weapon is coming? Does it, is it just a weapon being used against us? Is this what blows the hole in the wall? Uh, it's really impossible to tell, but... We know that's a weapon we're going to have to deal with. Our first look of Thancred here, of course, as well as some aerial battles. And it almost looks like they're trying to show us the attack on both fronts. It looks like we try to uh, spread their forces out equally on both sides by having an assault force on one side and an assault force on the other, which makes sense considering uh, what, we're look what we're going up against here, against the Garleans. So while he's got... I think we can see Yugiri back there. Uh, I don't see Gosetsu on any of these. Doesn't mean Gosetsu, anything has happened to him just yet. But it looks like they're almost launching an aerial assault. I don't know what he expects to do with the samurai sword while he's, uh, you know, riding a bird. But, uh, you know, Hien's probably got some pretty crazy powers. And then here you can see Pippin and Raubon, you know, storming a base. Once again, you can see here we have we have uh, Alamegan Resistance over on the right. We have Alice and Alphano. And once again, we have Ida taking charge of everything. We also have 
Uh, where, I wonder where this is, because it looks like this is another base, but it looks like this is us firing cannons. It's hard to tell if it's in defense of something or if it's an offense. I'd have to imagine it's the defense of a, of a, of a, of a stronghold that we've taken at some point in the story right there. Um, especially considering that we're standing on it and they're flying in to attack us, in a sense. And it's just explosions everywhere. And then finally, we get good old Xenosia Galvis walking towards us slowly once again with, with his, you know, Magitek Samurai weapons. And that is where it ends. Now, I'd like to say I thought that this was a phenomenal setup for Stormblood, at least for the storytelling of Stormblood. There's a lot of foreshadowing there. There's a lot of little details you can pick up about the characters. And the song is fitting to that of a war theme. So again, I highly recommend you check out Revolutions and... Uh, and I hope that we can enjoy Stormblood in less than a month at this point. So thank you for requesting this video. I'll have plenty of videos coming up in the near future. We have a live letter on Monday. Um, and then after I've gotten all of my, you know, everything together regarding uh, the media tour that I attended recently, we'll have all that information posted up here on YouTube as well. But anyway, thank you for watching. Be sure to like, favorite, subscribe, and share. Stay tuned. Until then, take care.